Glass shatters, a D-Class screams, the shill cry of an alarm sounds. There's been a containment breach at the SCP Foundation. Somehow the Plague Doctor has escaped his cell and is making a break for it. Against all odds, he finds the exit and he's out. He's free, he's on the lam. But how long can he elude the Foundation's attempts to track him down and recontain him at any cost? It will take all of his cunning, his intellect, and his strange anomalous abilities, but he's going to try and hold on to his newfound freedom as tightly as he can. I'm getting ahead of myself here though. Let's start at the beginning. Day 1. SCP-049, or the Plague Doctor, may be an esoteric anomaly whose grasp of medicine is practically medieval, but he's still a doctor. He didn't get this far by not paying attention to his surroundings. So when an unexpected power outage triggered by an experiment gone wrong somewhere in the bowels of Site-19 gave him the chance to escape captivity, well, he took it. The Foundation had recently revoked his access to live experimental subjects again, and he had had enough. It was time to seize the moment and make a mad dash for freedom. With the security system down, the doctor broke open the door to his cell, grabbed his trusty apothecary bag, and ran into the hall. Guards were already swarming, ready to drag him back into captivity, but he had planned ahead. Swiftly, he uncorked a glass bottle of silvery liquid, spilling it onto the floor, where it began to eat away at the tile, the shoes of the guards, and if they maintained contact for too long, the soles of their feet. This bought him just enough time to keep running. The sounds of screaming down another hall and the raucous laughter of one Dr. Jack Bright signaled to the doctor that most of the Foundation staff were otherwise occupied. With this in mind, he sprinted on, letting his chitinous body carry him to the exit. Then for the first time in far too long, fresh air on his beak, the sun in his eyes, the scent of cut grass and damp leaves from the last night's rain, the world was here, waiting for him just as he had left it. Of course, the world was still very much in danger. He hadn't just broken free for himself, but to address the pestilence head on as best as he could. But for now, as he heard the sound of the alarm, the guards gaining on him, he had to prioritize his own safety first. He had to hide. Day 2 he ran for ages. He couldn't be quite sure how long as he had no way to measure the passage of time except the position of the sun in the sky. It set, it rose, bathing the countryside in soft yellow light and set again, plunging the land into darkness, all while he continued to run. Then finally, the plague doctor stopped. He had found a farm. There was a little farmhouse, but he did not dare disturb the sleeping family and alarm them. Instead, he turned to the barn for shelter. He let himself in, tiptoed past the horses as they slept there, and made himself a bed from straw and a burlap sack. From his bag, he pulled a pillow and a little spray bottle. He misted the pillow with a lavender-scented oil and finally allowed himself a moment to rest. He did not need to sleep like ordinary men, but after such a long journey, he could get pretty close. Day 3 the morning of the Plague Doctor's third day of freedom began with the high-pitched whinny of a terrified horse and the frantic stamping of hooves. The doctor opened his eyes to the sight of one of the horses, now awake and not at all happy to see a stranger in its barn, making its fear and displeasure known. Buttercup? A man called from outside the barn. That you, girl? What's got you spooked? The door to the barn creaked open, and before the doctor could do anything, he was face to face with the farmer who owned the land. Who are you? What are you doing in my barn? The man demanded. Good sir, I apologize for the intrusion. I am but a humble traveler seeking shelter. You need to get out of here and stop scaring my horses now. Don't make me come back with my shotgun. No need for that sort of thing. I, I, I will be on my way. The doctor collected his things and decided to spare the old farmer rather than use more extreme methods to change his mind. He left the barn in a hurry. Day 4. Day 4. With the farm far behind him, the plague doctor trudged along on his journey, always keeping an eye out for unmarked vans and armed guards. So far though, he was safe. He hadn't had a spare moment to return to his experiments though, which was beginning to wear on him. The work was what had motivated him to break out in the first place, and now he wasn't sure when he would be able to make time for it. Cruel irony, indeed. 
But then, as if his silent prayer had been answered, he heard a peculiar sound coming from the woods, just off the dirt road he was walking down. A sickly bray from an injured animal, a poor soul in need, a patient. He followed the sound to its source. A deer lay on its side, clearly sick or injured somehow. Do not be afraid, my friend, the doctor said softly. You are sick, but I can make you well. He sat his bag down on the grass and got to work. First, he touched the deer with a gloved hand, stopping its heart and putting it out of its misery. Then he reached into his bag for his trusty tools and some of his best medicines. In no time at all, the deer was reanimated, cured, walking around again like new. Sure, it was a little bit different, stumbling a bit, and each eye looking in a different direction, but the doctor considered the treatment a success. A day well spent. Day 5 the next day, feeling reinvigorated after his successful encounter with the deer, the plague doctor began his quest for shelter anew. He walked for most of the day until, as the sun was setting, he came upon something curious. A house, dilapidated looking, with a large sign out front reading, House of Horrors, Enter If You Dare. Though he didn't know it, the doctor had stumbled upon the local town's premier seasonal haunted house attraction. To him, it was simply an empty house he could take up residence inside. He was curious and a bit perplexed as he walked past plastic skeletons, animatronic werewolves that popped out from behind styrofoam tombstones, and giant fake spiders and cotton cobwebs. None of the fake monsters gave him trouble, so though he was confused by what he saw, he continued to explore the house. Then, he found something incredible. A laboratory. There was a long stainless steel table with a mannequin strapped to it. A row of prop surgical tools sat on a tray next to the mannequin, and along the back shelf were rows and rows of jars filled with liquids that looked like something the plague doctor himself would pull out of his bag. He couldn't believe his eyes. After wandering aimlessly for days, he found the perfect place, almost as if it had been made just for him. Of course, it wasn't. It was for the paying customers who would be coming to the haunted house the next day, along with the actors hired to perform inside, but he didn't need to know any of that yet. He replaced the jars with his own and the tools with functioning ones. With the exception of the plastic body on the table, which he privately wished was a real human subject, this was absolutely perfect. Day 6 the haunt actors showed up for work and were surprised to find a new guy had beat them there, and he was already in costume. They shrugged it off. They were making minimum wage, and that wasn't enough to ask any questions. They were there to suit up and get spooky, and that was it. They did appreciate his Plague Doctor costume, though. It was much higher budget than anything they had. Did you make that get up yourself? Asked a friendly zombie. Indeed I did, the doctor replied cheerfully, happy to finally encounter a group of individuals who were unafraid of him. Nice, bro. The zombie gave him a thumbs up. And if the plague doctor could, with his rigid beaked face, he would have smiled. These new colleagues were a bit unusual looking, with their ghostly white faces, vampire fangs, green tinged makeup, and excess fur, but their kindness was encouraging. Meanwhile, the haunt actors were gossiping amongst themselves, wondering where the new plague doctor character came from. Who approved it? Who hired this guy? Why was he doing that accent? Whatever he was, whatever, he was plenty scary and nice enough guy to get to work with. So Frankenstein's monster let the plague doctor have the laboratory set and moved himself into the graveyard. The customers loved him too, shrieking with delight as he welcomed them into his laboratory, asking if any of them would like to volunteer to be a test subject. Lucky for them, they had already been warned not to touch any of the actors while walking through the attraction. As his first night at his unintentional job came to a close, the Plague Doctor's new friends bid him farewell. We're gonna go to a bar up the road for a couple drinks, the ghostly bride said. Wanna come? Ah, no time for revelry, the Plague Doctor replied. I must attend to my work. Take care, the woman just laughed. Okay, see you later. And so the plague doctor spent his night in the haunted house again, tinkering with his tools and his tissue samples, listening to the royalty-free scary music tape play again and again on repeat into the night. Day 7 The next day, attendance at the haunted house was slow. The actors, with little to do, spent their time scrolling aimlessly on their phones, filming joke videos for social media, and pranking each other. 
One of them got the bright idea to pull a prank on the new hire, the stranger that none of them knew much about. He would have a friend turn out the lights in the laboratory, and when the lights were turned back on, he would have replaced the mannequin on the table. He couldn't have known what would happen. All he wanted to do was startle the new guy, freak him out with the sight of an unexpected werewolf on his operating table. And it was effective. Sort of. The plague doctor froze in place when the lights went out calling, Hello? What is happening? And when the room was illuminated once more, he took in the sight of the living being on the operating table. My friend, you've come to me for treatment? The werewolf started to get up, disappointed he hadn't managed to elicit a scream, but the plague doctor reached out a hand to stop him, and that was curtains for that particular actor. As soon as the plague doctor's gloved hand made contact with the man in the werewolf costume, his heart stopped. Oh dear, the plague doctor remarked. Do not fear, I have the cure. You'll be alright in no time at all. By the time the rest of the actors came to see what had happened to the werewolf, there was a real zombie in the haunted house. Then, it was pure chaos. Actors running and screaming, knocking over props and abandoning their seasonal gig, darting between customers as they went, shrieking, Don't go in there! It's real! Naturally, this only made them want to check it out even more, but by the time they got inside, there was no sign of the plague doctor. Only one very lost zombie in a werewolf costume, a few jars broken in all the chaos, and footsteps in the dry grass outside, leaving town. Days 8 to 18. The plague doctor spent all of his eighth day on the run, walking once more. He was starting to get used to this, the endless drudgery of the path to freedom. He hated to admit it, but he was almost starting to miss his cell back at the foundation, the routine of it, the quiet time to work, the three meals given to him each day, even though he didn't need to eat to survive, he missed food and drink, the simple pleasures of bread, meat, cheese, fruit, a mug of tea, a cup of wine. He sighed to himself wistfully. Then he caught a whiff of something lovely. He lifted his beak, taking in another deep breath. The unmistakable scent of roast pheasant, hearty and warm. Beneath it, something else. Mulled wine, spiced and inviting. Smells that reminded him of home, of days long lost. He couldn't be certain where it would lead, or if there would be a seat for him at the table, but he couldn't resist following the heavenly aroma to its source. As he drew closer to the smell of food and merriment, he could hear music, the plucking of a lyre, the high trill of a flute, singing and clapping. Then he finally spotted it. Rows of colorful tents, long banquet tables, minstrels wandering about and playing ballads to anyone who would listen, men, women, and children frolicking in elaborate costumes, plate armor, robes, gowns, and more. Though the plague doctor didn't know how to describe what he was seeing, he had wandered onto the site of one of the state's largest renaissance fairs. It just so happened to be opening day, and he was just in time for the celebratory feast. Good day, doctor. A nobleman tipped his hat to SCP-049. Are you speaking to me? The plague doctor was taken aback by the recognition. Why, of course. You're the only doctor I see. Her Majesty the Queen thanks you for your service, for keeping us all safe from the Great Plague. The plague doctor had no idea that this man was an actor, playing along with him in what he assumed was a scene for the tourists. Instead, he took the words to heart, swelling with pride and gratitude for the recognition. Good sir, it is my duty and my honor. The plague doctor nodded politely. Luckily for him, and unbeknownst to the rest of the cast of players at the fair, the man originally hired to play the town plague doctor had booked a commercial role that morning and decided not to go in to work. The man's choice not to call and let anyone know, though rude, led to a fortuitous misunderstanding for SCP-049. Please, join us at the royal table. The nobleman made a sweeping gesture with his arm, inviting the doctor to sit and dine with him and the rest of the actors playing members of the court. Thank you for your kindness. If he could, the plague doctor would have smiled. He dined to his heart's content that afternoon, listening to sounds of music and laughter. He slotted into his role at the fair even better than his position at the haunted house. He answered questions from tourists about his work as a physician, warned them of the dangers of the great pestilence, and posed for the occasional photograph. He spent a wonderful ten days living in a stylized artificial version of the past, basking in the warm glow of camaraderie. Though the other actors wondered why he never took his mask off, even to eat. Then, sadly, it was time for the fair to pack up for the season. The plague doctor bid his new friends farewell. 
and declined their offers to exchange numbers and keep in touch. He would, however, always remember them fondly. Days 19 through 41. As he was departing the fairgrounds, the doctor caught a glimpse of strange men approaching some of the actors, showing federal badges and asking them questions. He couldn't be certain that it was the Foundation, but it was more than enough to make him cautious. He would have to retreat into the woods once more and stay out of sight. He laid low for quite some time, for 22 days to be exact. But then, on day 41, day 41 to 52, it started to snow. White blanketed the forest floor, soft and cold. The weather wouldn't kill him, of course, but it was uncomfortable. He would need to find some more efficient shelter to escape from the elements before the winter storm worsened. He trudged through the snow into a new town, small and quaint. There was an abandoned church at the edge of the main road, a bit broken down, but the roof held firm against the onslaught of ice and wind. So the plague doctor made it his new home for the next 12 days, working quietly and staying out of sight. Day 53 to 57. On the eve of the plague doctor's 53rd day on the run from the SCP Foundation, he was stirred from his work by the sound of a choir of beautiful voices outside. He looked to find a group of Christmas carolers singing together. The rows of houses along the streets covered in colorful lights and glittering decorations. Wanting to get a little closer to the music, the doctor left his hiding spot for the first time in nearly two weeks. But as the choir saw a strangely shaped dark shadow emerging from the abandoned church, they screamed and scattered in every direction. One of them yelled something about the Krampus as they went. Frightened by the whole interaction, SCP-049 found himself a new spot under a bridge. It was cold but isolated, at least it was, for five days. Day 58 On day 58, a group of local teenagers, rowdy and looking to make some trouble, spotted the plague doctor squatting under the bridge. They pelted him with snowballs, laughing. Before he could do anything about it, fortunately for the teens, they then ran back to their car and sped away. Drenched in ice and cold water, miserable and irritated, the plague doctor searched for another place to stay. Day 59 to Day 84 The plague doctor was able to slip into another relatively quiet building, the local community theater, which happened to be an old opera house repurposed as the site of volunteer-run musicals. While the townsfolk began rehearsals for the production of The Phantom of the Opera, the plague doctor watched from above, hiding in the shadows. Every so often, the stagehand would catch a glimpse of a cape, the silhouette of a face, a pair of dark eyes, but no one believed her when she tried to tell them that the phantom was real. At least until a handyman went up into the rafters to install some lights and saw the plague doctor for himself. Then it was time for him to flee to a new town. Day 85 to Day 89 On Day 85, the plague doctor climbed up onto the roof of a dark house to avoid a particularly aggressive dog and let himself in through the attic window. The next morning, a little girl came up into the attic in search of a lost toy and found him there. He waited for her to scream, but she didn't. She introduced herself as Abby and asked if he would like some cookies and milk. He accepted her gracious offer, and the two visited with each other for several days until Abby's parents asked who she was talking to. They didn't take it well when she answered, the Birdman in the attic. Day 90 on day 90, Abby's parents called the police, who had been warned to look out for a man in a bird mask, and got in touch with their contacts at the SCP Foundation. Feeling the authorities closing in, SCP-049 took to the wilderness once more. Day 91 to Day 99 Though the air was still painfully cold, the plague doctor managed to set up camp, using tools from his bag to build a fire and construct a makeshift tent. He stayed there for three days before intending to move on and throw the Foundation off of his trail, but he was slowed by the appearance of a group of hikers bundled up against the winter weather and exploring the woods. Afraid he couldn't trust them, the doctor touched one to convince him to leave. The man fell to the ground dead, and as his companions ran away screaming, the doctor vowed to cure him. Working against the inopportune conditions, it took him five more days to reanimate the hiker. On day 100 of his time on the lam, the Foundation finally closed in. The Plague Doctor was just stitching up a large incision in his patient's chest when he heard the click of a gun behind him. Come with us peacefully, and we won't have to sedate you, the officer said. With a heavy sigh, the Plague Doctor held up his hands, stepping back from his patient just as its undead body sat up, blinking its unseeing eyes. Very well, I will go back. To tell you the truth, gentlemen, 
This has all been a bit too much trouble. I could use the rest. Now go check out SCP-049 The Plague Doctor Captured and SCP-049 Cures SCP-096 of the Pestilence for more of your favorite mysterious masked doctor.